door open. Thank you. Oh, okay. And well, um, Andrea, I come approach. Just a um, couple of comments on uh, Yan. Uh, this notion, I, I agree that uh, there was an increase in tendency, especially during the 90s, in, the, in changing the paradigm of war from the international framework towards this kind of governmentality and the new technology of the self. But to me, what Iraq marked was really the war in Iraq was really the failure of this kind of tendency. What happened was that, in a way, in Iraq, I think most people, and not only in the Arab world, but also in the, in the West, uh, really experienced that there was not any kind of hyper-modern technology of the South in Iraq. That was just a brutal, old, anachronistic colonial action. You have oil, I'm gonna conquer you. And uh, this anachronism really marked a really um, a huge symbolic rupture. Are we still at this point that you come here and you conquer for oil, saying that um, there were connections between uh, Saddam and Al Qaeda, and then uh, there were mass uh, weapons of mass destruction, and then democracy, and then we see it's oil. At least this was the perception. There really a sort of anachronism a classic uh, 20th century form of conquering. And this anachronism was transposed to the level of local regimes. Are we still at this point with these uh, kings? And, um, and this was essential to me. Um, on the one side, this anachronism. On the other side, the panic and the horror that we experienced for the first time after decades in terms of power and regimes the horror, the impotence of the regime in front of something going on, this rupture. And uh, I cannot forget, for instance, the speech of Gaddafi when he was uh, saying that rebels were just assuming drugs and pills and hallucinogens. That was a frenzy talk. And people, what they saw was that the king was drunk, mad, naked. That was really, I think, the two, the two moment of reformulating the, the symbolic scenario. At the same time, this emphasis on this rupture and the, the insistence that somehow you are making, even if you also highlight the continuity of a sort of subjectivity going on there, but this emphasis you are making on this moment as the moment of the founding of the post-colonial subject is problematic to me. This term awakening is problematic. Were Arabs sleeping before? No. And um, if the uh, ruptures is also the result of the success of the event, so it's the success of the event that uh, allows us to, to uh, localize the moment of founding of subjectivity, that is problematic. What happens when, if this event does not occur? Do we have to to the missing, the absence of the subject? So, uh, 50, uh, the Nasserite revolution, are you referring to the canal, uh, Su uh, the Swiss canal um, operation by Nasser in 56, or the um, free officer revolution of 52, which was anyway also an Islamist revolution, because the Muslim brothers were together with the free officers. In that sense, there was already a, a subject going on, a post-colonial subject going on. To me, um, the founding of the post-colonial subject was also in 98 with the foundation of the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, the moment where, when there was this kind of symbolic organization of new subject that can, you know, operate some kind of... Anyway, the, the, the question is this, this tension between continuity and rupture and uh, this problem of the awakening. Shall we pick some questions and... Um, I will kindly ask you to try to stick to the question as much as, you, as much as you can, so everybody or as much people as possible can ask me that. Thank you. Well, my question is very much related to that point 
very important that you were pointing to the uh, persistent desire of the colonizer to remain despite the form of decolonization, which Spivak uh, called a long time ago uh, the failure of decolonization, I think that rightfully so. But then switching, I, I thought uh, you were too quick for the, in the way you were approaching to the, the so-called Arab Spring, or awakening, even the term spring to me, it's a, it's a terribly uh, Western media discourse naming this uh, thing, the spring, democracy, finally in that part of the world, that's spring flourishing. So this ecstatic um, uh, privileging of what was going on in the Middle East by the media, uh, you seem to be kind of going along with it uh, quickly, rushing uh, too quickly, I felt. Even terms like moderate Islam, that, which didn't come up necessarily in the case of the Arab Spring or, or, or um, awakening, but that was the former thing. In opposition to the Islamic fundamentalism, it was the moderate Islam. That was why Turkey was so loved and privileged Islamic, yet modern and uh, democratic and so on and so forth because of, you know, they can establish fantastic alliances, especially the U.S. with uh, the Turkish government in running their policies in the Middle East. So, um, I think with these terms, I think we should problematize uh, the, the very term of the spring. I thought you were dismissing or ignoring or not paying enough attention to the nature of intervention in the so-called Arab Spring. Thanks. Also, if you can say your name and your affiliation. Huh? Yeah. Uh, where, there was a question. Tara is there. Another three and four. Oh, sorry. We have Tara. Um, you. <laughs> you were there. You were there, five, okay. But we're going to take two more, we stop, and then the three, okay? Thank you. My question is for Anka. Thank you for all your papers. Um, but for Anka, really, this point that you made about the denial of a genealogy of exclusion that then means that people can't deal with the operations of contemporary hatred or contemporary racism within Europe is really interesting. And I'm wondering if there isn't an affective dimension to this, like the affective experience of comfort, right? That if we can deny that there is racism, then we feel comforted by this. And I'm wondering if you are familiar with the work of Sarah Ahmed and the promise of happiness and how this idea of being the killjoy feminist or destroying happiness by bringing up contemporary racism might be part of this genealogy of contemporary denial of exclusion. And then in this way, I'm also wondering if psychoanalysis might be useful at all to your work in looking at how people can continually ignore their own genealogies of exclusion. Ricardo Bandissona Burbeck. Uh, I'd like to come back to the shift from uh, universalism to u universalization. And I'd like to generalize the shift. Uh, what, what's at stake, it seems to me, uh, it's the logic of identity in general. The logic with which we construct the world as a series of entities. And this, on, on the one side, uh, freezes, so to speak, uh, external differences. And on the other side, erases internal differences. Okay rightly uh, was underlined. And, and if this is the stake, then uh, we need to, a change of vocabulary, uh, a general change of vocabulary, and a, a change from, uh, from entities to trajectories. And uh, I already detected this change of vocabulary because Sadiq was talking about equalization rather than equality, very pleased with it. Or Anke was saying uh, universalizing, and, and I'm thinking to the subject in Gaminda uh, uh, presentation, the, the, the overlapping of uh, um, um, dispossession and enslavement, 
in the States, for instance, uh, reminds me of the claims of the descendants of the former black slaves of Cherokees. In that case, uh, a subject wouldn't help. It's a, it's a tra trajectory of subjectivation. So uh, I'm, I'm perplexed by the use of subject in, in the end book. Um, so first of all, Andrea, many thanks for your question. Um, in, in relation to, in the, there were several points that I take on board, absolutely, in what, in what you said. Iraq w was indeed a war of dispossession. And I, I write about that, you know, the oil factor was very important. But as was the governing of that space, that political economic space, which was the almost immediate privatization of the Iraqi oil industry, an industry that had been nationalized um, for decades earlier, not just on, under the Ba'ath Party, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I totally did, did, uh, take, take that on board. Um, in terms of rupture and continuity, I mean, in, in the context of international relations, the, you could say that the Iraq war was a rupture of established norms, which is why international law, even as it exists today, could label that war a war of aggression. Right? So, you know, was the war a rupture into that? Now, I'm arguing that the war was a rupture into that, because it wasn't just that moment of invasion that is uh, evocative of rupture, but it's also this idea that you can then govern other societies. All of Iraq's institutions were dismantled, and then um, practices of governmentality began to take place in the midst of that location as a location of war, right? So. Um, you had a, the juxtaposition of uh, violence within neighborhoods and, and uh, various areas of, of Iraq. You had practices like the playing of loud music as a mode of punishment against villagers. Um, however, then you had the transfer of, and, and a number of people have written about this, of models of policing that were created in New York to police murder and, you know, uh, violent criminality in New York. These very practices were then established as murdered governments in Iraq, right? So, you know, the, the question of rupture and, and continuity is very interesting, but I, I'm interested in the continuities from the colonial era, because the very same practices were taking place to govern the Iraqi population and others in the, in the colonized uh, areas. You know, those same practices were taking place. Now, to quickly jump to the notion of the Arab awakening, I have problematized the concept of spring and the concept of, of, of the awakening. But why the idea of this concept awakening is important is because it refers back to a very powerful text and a very critical, reflexive text that came out in the 1940s and that was authored by a Lebanese-Syrian author called uh, George Antonius, the, uh, called The Arab Awakening. Right? And that Arab Awakening was about the definition and the establishment and the contestation over what the Arab nation means. Um, I want to disagree with you about the role of the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood as a moment of founding. Um, they were one amongst the, and they get a mention, but they were one amongst a number of political discourses that were going on in the 1920s, in, in, in 1920s Egypt. And that's significant because the constitution that they author in the early 1920s, indeed recognizes the diversity of, polit of politics, of contestation, 
that existed in Egyptian society. And Najib Mahfouz, the great Nobel laureate, Egyptian author, captures this political contestation that was going on in Egypt. Now, compare that with colonial discourses, which reduce the complexity of Egyptian society to sectarian conflict and, you know, conflict within a kind of civil war within Islam hypothesis, which we also see today. So to quickly jump um, to, 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 to the question, I think I've um, uh, covered elements of that. You're absolutely right. There was an ecstatic, as you put it, nicely put, by the way, um, uh, ecstatic celebration of, of, of the Arab Spring. But I can tell you, the uh, in the Western media, but I can tell you right now that, uh, if you like, that ecstasy was being experienced and celebrated in, in the streets of the Middle East. Right? So it was not an ecstasy that was reflected by the democratizing institutions in the West, but rather this was a generation that for the first time could indeed find its, find a voice, a political voice uh, that had been lost to their parents. Right? If you, for example, if you take the, um, the number of Middle Eastern exiles in London alone, is a, you know, that, that is an indication of the silencing of political subjectivity that, that has taken place over the decades in the post-colonial era. Now, what about intervention in the Arab Spring? I also write in the book about governing the revolution because there have been practices, and we're seeing them unraveling right now in the West that seek to capture the revolutions that have taken place and that are taking, the revolutionary moment, in other words, is being captured, is being reshaped and redrawn, right? So, uh, and I write about those practices, but I was confined to 20 minutes, so I can elaborate on that. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Tara, for your, um, your um, idea of um, also taking up the affective dimension that might be um, relevant in this denial of a genealogy of um, exclusion. I think that's, um, that's definitely a very important point. Um, and um, I also like the suggestion to say it's an it's a affective, affective, affect of um, comfort Though I would actually like to try to um, connect this to this question of, um, of privilege that's also always um, in there. So um, how would the affect then be a possibility to actually also um, ignore the power dimension that's actually put on the table? Um, yeah, I guess you're absolutely right in referring to Sarah Ahmed and this normative demand for happiness. Uh, because this is exactly um, the other side of the, the um, if you want so, of the breakdown of um, cohabitation that um, experiences again and again this moment where we are sharing the world with people we have not chosen and which are challenged to us um, and instead of taking this up, um, pretend that there is um, some kind of um, universal, um, pre-given universal that um, unites us and that um, might be happiness on a on an effective level or equality uh, or presumed equality on a on a level of, of um, principles. Um, yeah, I think psychoanalysis is also um, an important, it is an important framework for me and um, I think it's particularly thinking about um, relations of desire. So I have been talking about these um, relations of power and desire which are um, intertwined from my perspective, completely intertwined. Um, and so psychoanalysis for me is not so much interesting in or also in understanding how um, uh, denial uh, becomes reenacted continuously, but it's also a question of how 
we can actually um, figure out forms of um, related intersubjectivity and relationality that do not build upon a subject object logic. So if you take um, Teresa de Loretta's or Judith Butler's reading of psychoanalysis, then you would also come, um, always come to a reading of desire that um, falls back onto the subject and um, turns the subject into an ecstatic self that doesn't own itself. And then we come to another question of relationality. So it would be the relationality of um, exactly the opposite of this um, subject of self-ownership that um, Gominder um, had been talking about. So the, the modernist subject that um, pretends to own itself and um, um, claims the ownership of others um, can be subverted, I think, from a psychoanalytic uh, perspective. And this was, of, would, of course, also relate to um, what you have been talking about. Why are we um, continuously referring back to the question of the subject and not frame the whole field in, um, in another vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary? And I think this is interesting concerning the question of citizenship. So I would actually maybe even go as far as say, let's get rid of the term citizenship, uh, citizen, and actually talk about citizenship as a field of um, practices and relationalities, so that we get into um, into view the question of how are these relationalities um, somehow in a Foucauldian sense. Um, defined by um, relations of power and desire, and um, how would this become the, the question of political struggle and political transformation? So we want to transform these relationalities rather than um, inventing a new form of political identity or political subjectivity. I would, I would second that by simply saying one needs to temporalize the act of theory itself. So the concept universal or universality is a temporalizing process. So indeed, if I, if I value equalization, it's because I don't see a distinction between alterity and equality. So maybe I think I should clarify that. The process of equalization is a process where the self becomes other to itself, right? In other words, equality is a process of the self becoming ecstatic. Um, and that's precisely, and that capability is not limited to only some. And precisely that's where we are equal. That would be the argument of equalization. That the citizens' capacities and the capacities of the non-citizen cannot be posited as being strictly separate. Right? And the process of equalization is precisely that of the citizen becoming non-citizen and the other way around. Not in a Deleuzian sense, but sometimes in a very practical staging sense of, uh, even though the Mauro case was disturbing because of its culturalist logic, um, it, it highlighted a kind of quite growing campaigning across different spheres of civil society around asylum seekers. And what is striking were the images, which were the absence, if you will, of names, nations, but the proliferation of numbers, so that people were uh, blindfolding themselves or gagging themselves, and they just had numbers of, the numbers of course being the cases, uh, the case numbers, right, which the immigration, and that would be a staging of this kind of equalization, which is where the citizen becomes other, ecstatic. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I think one needs to get out of that division, there's identity and alterity, or there's alterity and equality. If one thinks of equality as mm -hmm. becoming other to yourself, mm -hmm. that's what equalization mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Can I just make one sentence? Um, because I think that's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, <laughs> interesting um, in, a, in a double sense. The one thing is that um, I think this connects very well to what Fatima is ta uh, ta uh, is talking about when she is kind of um, talking about queering um, ethnicity or queering race um, in these um, multi-ethnic um, networks of urban populations because they are actually kind of like trying to um, find forms of articulation and um, claiming the public sphere, um, but indeed as um, 
um, political subjects that do not um, um, gain their uh, authority from some like authentic um, cultural belonging, but from um, acting um, in collaborative, pra collaborative practices. And I think, uh, I, I also think that, the, that our positions are fairly um, similar in actually um, seeing citizenship as, this, uh, um, as the field of negotiation. So um, I think the, the question would be whether this process of equalizing that um, turns the self into um, another would be something that could also involve the state. So you, you have kind of the state because um, the state in your um, um, narrative is something like very much like an entity and, and um, something that doesn't kind of like um, contain this kind of rupture. So I'm wondering whether one could somehow slightly shift the um, power dimension towards um, the civil society and then kind of like ask how about um, what are the practices, um, resistances or whatsoever that um, also rupture um, the state and um, include what is formally seen as an entity as a more um, fragmented field of um, relationalities and practices that also become other to itself. Okay, we have an issue with time, so we're going to make another round, but I beg you to be, you know, to point. So, we have the... Uh, she didn't know what. <laughs> Uh, there? Yeah, was it you or? Okay, so I have a question there. Yes, but uh, there were other people first. So. Um, hello, my name is Małgorzata Bajakimu, I'm from the University of Manchester. Uh, I have a question uh, specifically to Vivian and Suri, I think, but also to Antke to a point. And my question concerns methodology of theorizing of post-orientalism or, post or the orientalization. Um, because I think what quite often happens is that when we try to deorientalize, we actually arrive at essentialization. Like, for example, uh, yesterday's, in yesterday's talk about China and the video of Martin Jacques, we could actually see something that, yes, it is the westernizing, but at the same time it's not the orientalizing. What is happening there is actually essentializing of category of China in the same way as we orientalize the category of the West. So the boundaries are very much the West East. And I'm, I'm just wondering how we can think about the orientalizing without falling into essentialisms. So I think you very nicely actually put it in your thought. It's the, the question of political, the question of um, you, you uniting, you know, unity between uh, the, the figure of migrant asylum seeker and, and the, the representative of the Western society that is called society. And I think that's the way to uh, to probably look at the orientalization without falling into essentialism, but I would like to know more how you would deal with it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Brenna Bandor and I'm from the School of Law at Queen Mary. Um, I have a question for uh, Sudeep and one for Anka. Um, Sudeep, your paper was so eloquent, it's, it's very difficult to try and trouble such an eloquent paper, but I wanted to try to ask a question about um, uh, the, the resources that you're looking to to try to reconceptualize uh, political citizenship, Ranciere and Marx. And I was very, uh, you know, pleased with this, um, with the way you refer to the radical intervention they make into thinking of political citizenship by bringing in the socioeconomic and class dimensions to exclusion. Um, and in the second part of your talk, when you spoke about this particular case, you outlined uh, um, very clearly how the cultural discourse is one that actually encodes racial difference. 
And so my question is whether um, in the work of Marx and Ranciere, just thinking about the On the Jewish Question essay, whether we can um, easily analogize the critique he's making of religion with racial difference, or are there actually presuppositions, even in Marx's notions of civil society, you know, that presuppose a particular racial constitution of civil society and the, con and the, the categories he's employing. So that was the first question. And the second question for Anka, and I'm sure this probably has no answer, um, so I'll apologize in advance, but it's an important question, I think, is um, I really appreciate the way in which Judith Butler, in, in her book, sort of decenters the question of sovereignty especially in thinking about the colonial settler context. I think it's a, it's a really important intervention. And my question is, in then taking that back to think about law, um, how, if we're, if we're displacing sovereignty and a universalizing logic, if there's anything that relies for its being on universalizing logic and abstraction, it's law. And so, yeah, you mentioned this notion of universe, universalizing as a temporary closure in the work of Mona Hanafi, I think. But, you know, that, that could be a way of describing the way a common law tradition already operates. You could look at the way that historically how common law operates, it's always a temporary closure in, in the universal it, it posits. So, um, I guess my question is, is and I guess this just requires a huge amount of imagination, how, how do we take the critique that um, Butler is making and kind of how does that boomerang back onto thinking about le the legal form? I'll begin with the pleasantries before I get the mic. Uh, I greatly enjoyed uh, all four presentations, but um, my questions are to, to Vivienne and to Sudeep. Um, Vivian, I'm not quite convinced that consolidating the post-colonial subject because the European is consolidated is, um, is an ideal response because in doing so, do we not hide the nuances, the scales, the levels of abjectness within uh, these multiple post-colonial subjects, right? Um, once again, to go back to what I tried to suggest yesterday, why not factor Europe in response, right? why not fracture Europe in response, right? And there is no greater moment, perhaps, than the present in which to fracture, mom, uh, fracture Europe after this, uh, this spell in which they've uh, assumed that there's one Europe. Um, also, is there not a fetishization of resistance here when we, uh, in, in, the, in, 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 your, in your presentation? The second point, the moment of founding does it not run counter to what Gurminder has been suggesting? Um, of, um, does it not create once more the realm of the public as political, right, and the private as non-political? Um, uh, for example, what happens in this, uh, in this case, let's say, the, the, the case of Egypt, what happens to negotiation of family relations, of relations within patriarchy, right? Uh, are these not also negotiations of citizenship, but they're definitely not being played out in the public, uh, polit uh, public realm? To Sudeep, um, I think you see the disturbance between civil society and state because you assume that there's a distinction between state and civil society. I just like to point to in the direction of what Parker Chatterjee has been suggesting of the distinction between civil society which is the realm of high modernity of elites who have a privileged relationship with law and political society, which is persons outside of modernity who do not get rights but always get concessions. And if you look at it in this, in this manner, then you can see the manner in which the so-called civil society is in fact just reproducing state discourse in, in terms of saying, look, look, look at these individual cases, right? We're not speaking about the law here. We're speaking of individual cases, these colored people who are sufficiently westernized, therefore they can stay, right? So what you see here really is the operation of civil society as a realm of modernity, saying, let's hand out these little tokens of concessions to uh, these people from political society. Stop there. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
Marie Fanny, a research fellow at, at Oxford. Thank you for the fabulous presentations. Um, my question is for Gaminter. Uh, we know that uh, race and gender have, have been uh, constitutive of uh, the creation of American citizenship from the inception of the Republic. So I would like to ask, how does the election of Obama to the pre presidency signify, if anything at all? And for Vivienne, um, uh, morality and uh, um, mo moral aspects are intertwined in the creation of the political subjectivity. And the people who were um, demonstrating on Tahrir Square were talking about uh, their effort to recapture their dignity. So I was wondering whether in this uh, new political environment in the Middle East, you are capturing a moral element that perhaps is informing the reconstitution of uh, people's political subjectivity. Question about how does one? Um, yesterday, what struck me in, in, in the discussion was in, uh, what was missing seemed to be the notion of the complete of paths, which Anon talked about in the context of decolonization. So, if we value cultural identity so much in the age of deorientalization, then the, the, the notion of the complete of class gets lost. I think that's part of my problem with deorientalization, de which does not take in political economy into account. I think the examples we heard yesterday of land grabs, of converting tribals into terrorists, etc., uh, very much follows that contemporary neo-imperial logic, right, of, of mining, of uh, fisheries, example, becoming commodity. Um, so I think that concept for me was running around in my head. I thought the notion of the comprador class today would become interesting to undercut the East-West dimension. Also, um, going back to, to, to Gurminder's uh, talk, um, the other person who was, um, you brought up Tocqueville there, was, was also, every time Marx tried to discuss what free labor and the free market meant, and particularly Westminster and what was happening in Westminster, he goes to the new world. That is, he goes to, um, America and to India, and he says the truth of democracy and the truth of freedom is actually found in the colonies, which is that we need the colonies to talk about freedom in the metropole. So I think that double perspective there is also um, interesting to update for today. Indeed, there is a cultural, I would say there's absolutely a cultural or a racial provenance to how Marx would think of, of civil society. Um, my, I kind of deployed that argument on the Jewish question um, because I liked his move of shifting the question of should Jews give up Judaism in public life, saying that's not the question. The question is we assume that the state is universal. And I, I liked, uh, so I, I was indeed um, using that argument for the way he shifts the perspective and saying we need to look at the, what the state claims to be doing. Um, but indeed, I would say there are, I'm sure there are conceptions within civil society which are raised over there. At the same time, underlining that every time he needs to criticize, uh, you know, the last supplements to volume one of Capital, uh, every time he needs to explain what freedom means, he ends up going to settler colonies and to colonialism in India to do that. So he was quite also aware of the bourgeois ideals of equality, what they actually meant. Uh, gosh, the last one. Political, I'm not so sure, I'm convinced that, that civil society is a sphere of high modernity and politics is outside the law. Um, I'm not sure why one would have to take that as a definition. Um, so quickly I say that, I, I would not want to, I think um, the purpose precisely was to say the distinction between state and civil society is blurry. But 
what's useful about the contradictions in Gramsci is that he keeps contradicting himself. Right? At some point, one aspect of society is part of the state, in another argument it's not. And I think that's fine. Those contradictions actually show that it's the analysis of individual cases which determine where those boundaries are. And I'd, I'd rather stick to that argument than say politics happens in this sphere and high modernity is there. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, hi, thanks for that. I want to start just by sort of putting the talk in a little bit of a wider context as well, because it was about who gets to grant citizenship. You know, or the question of what makes a citizen, in a sense, is so often asked in the context of contemporary struggles that we don't ask what makes the non-citizen such that he or she has to now struggle or claim those rights. And so what I'm interested in specifically are the historical processes of exclusion that contribute to state building. And one way in which we can sort of see this within a contemporary example is the Aboriginal citizenship ceremonies being take, taking place in Australia, for example, where a group of Aboriginal elders have convened a citizenship ceremony in order to confer citizenship rights to those that the state seeks to exclude with the argument, well, why does the state have the right to grant citizenship? We were earlier inhabitants. We wish to welcome these people onto this land, which we claim as a land to be shared, and so on. So I think that that's quite a radical gesture in terms of disrupting those claims and, and the struggles and so on. But to go specifically to the question about what the election of Obama signifies, I mean, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think he's a politician. He's not the Messiah. He's not going to save the US or the world. But what's significant to me is not necessarily the election of Obama in its own terms, but rather the actions of the population who voted for him. And so this aspect that you have a significant, you know, over 50% of the population of the US voted for a black man and an African-American family to occupy the White House. And I think the aspect of Michelle Obama specifically occupying the White House and being the first lady of the nation is almost a more radical gesture than the election of Obama himself. But just to finish, I mean, I don't think we should underestimate the significance of what Obama occupying that position then also means for people who are involved in struggles for equality and for social justice. And so in a way, there are so many different Obamas that we have to allow what his significance is to be different in those different contexts. Maybe I can um, connect to your first point where you were referring to um, these um, indigenous groups um, conferring citizenship rights to um, people who are excluded from that. Because I think that would be interesting in relation to um, the question, I don't know, um, your name, about the legal, um, about the legal form. Because I think what is interesting if we understand the legal form as a, to uh, as a temporary closure, as a form of abstraction and temporary closure, which I think is um, a self-understanding of the, the law of um, legal processes, um, then I think one of the questions raised um, on the background of Butler is whether in these um, processes of abstraction and universalizing that are taking place, um, the legal um, institution itself um, can relativize um, its um, relativize and at the same time um, open the possibility for um, different um, genealogy, genealogies, different origins, and also those that are not um, understandable or not intelligible within the um, given um, normative or um, epistemological framework and say, um, okay, there are different versions of justice and we can always only capture a few of them and the, um, um, the nation state process that actually installs a law um, can um, always kind of like be open for the fact that there is a civil society and that there is something like citizenship practices um, that um, produce a horizon for what's happening and um, open up for, for these um, challenges and, and um, processes. I mean, I think this is something that 
in Germany more and more comes up with people um, um, going to the constitutional law in um, claiming um, rights that are not possible to claim within the um, lower federal levels. Okay, thank you once again for, for your really interesting questions. Um, I'm a bit puzzled by the first one and the second round because um, I think I was probably being accused of uh, being essentialist and I'm not essentializing at all. You know, all, all my work is uh, questions any possibilities of, of essentializing. So I'm going to move on very swiftly um, to, to the question of uh, consolidating the post subject and why, you know, why, why make this gesture. I absolutely ag agree with um, uh, Chakrabarty's notion of provincializing Europe. And in fact, I so agree with him, I wish I drew it in the book. You know, when, you, when you're really jealous of, of a particular book, but it's, I wish I had put on that book. So I, I completely agree with the notion of uh, diversity within the subject. I'm not totalizing the post-colonial subject. That's the last thing I'm, I'm doing. Rather, it's a historical uh, discourse. I'm saying that the post-colonial subject, in a sense, emerges, comes about, but it's always a contested site, right? And the post-colonial subject as such uh, always has an excess, if you like, that's actually uncapturable. So, uh, you know, our discourses, our attempts within the social sciences, within philosophy and the humanities, our attempts to capture the subject um, are a kind of lost cause because, because the subject always has the capacity to escape. Um, and I discuss this in, in relation to Fanon, I, I discuss it in all sorts of uh, ways, literary uh, articulations and, uh, and so on. So I'm not seeking to stabilize the post-colonial subject. Now, having said that, my project is a politics project. Um, and I hope that any project on citizenship that you guys all share here is indeed a project on politics and, and its locations. Where does politics actually take place and how do we in, instantiate and articulate uh, you know, the spatiality and the temporality of, of, of politics. And um, you made reference to the fe fetishization of, of resistance. I'm historicizing resistance. I'm not, I'm not fetishizing it. So, um, so that's what I'm doing. There are moments of resistance. And the challenge for the author is how to, in a sense, capture those moments but allow them to kind of take flight as well. So, in writing and engaging with history is a very difficult thing in that sense. So that in, in the book, for example, um, I recount Hannah Batatu, who's a very, very influential um, Arab author, a historian. He gives an account of a particular demonstration taking place in the 1920s, a very significant demonstration in Iraqi history in particular and how there was a class discourse going on within that, within that demonstration. So what I'm saying here is that there is a need to historicize resistance rather than to, so I'm not fetishizing it at all. Um, on the moment of founding and its exclusionary potential, absolutely, moments of founding are moments of contestation. There will be the excluded. That's what politics uh, is about. Now, the charge of the private and the, and the public, there is a, you know, there are moments of resistance within the private sphere. But I think it's important, even as, as a feminist who has questioned the dichotomy between the private and the public, I think the public as such is a space that's constituted by particular actions, the actions of subjects, right? The public constitutes as well as it being constituted. So that's how I would, uh, that's how I indeed conceptualize uh, the, 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 the sphere of the public. So, you know, um, uh, if anything, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, doing that. On the concept of dignity, I think that's, 
you know, dignity as a concept is such an important concept now. And I'd love to write about it. You know, you've got, you've got dignity and the, this notion of the indignant as well. We were talking about that in the conversation here yesterday. The, the notion of the indignant, the Spanish indignato movement, for example. It's such an interesting concept, especially when we bring it in and invoke it in a political context. And I'd, I'd love to write about it. Thank you, everybody. Um, this note, we end this session, and we're free to go without some lunch. Thank you, everyone.